I'm Tammy, a brown belt and coach from the UK. I joined Premium with the free seven day trial about a year ago, and I haven't regretted that once. I immediately binged on some audio content. The Discord server is worth the cost of membership alone. It's uh, a bit like entering a virtual open mat full of white to black belts from various countries. And the vibe's always friendly and respectful and helpful. I highly recommend joining BJJ Mental Models Premium. And I look forward to chatting with you in their Discord server. Those are some words from Tammy. She's one of hundreds of grapplers around the world who have leveled up their jujitsu game with BJJ Mental Models Premium. Join Premium today and you'll get the world's largest library of jiu-jitsu audio courses on strategy and tactics, plus direct coaching from black belt world champions, plus access to the most valuable online jiu-jitsu community. Your first week's free, so please check it out now at bjjmentalmodels.com or check the link in the show notes. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 264. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And I'm back again with returning champion, normally from Estonia, but today I believe from somewhere in the United States, Mr. Preet Mikkelsen. How's it going, Preet? Good morning. All good so far. A little bit tired, but all good. <laughs> so what brings you to the United States, by the way? Oh, it's just uh, traveling. Going to Sunbart, just that everything worked out better the, this way that I came came through here. And now Sunday morning, early, like yeah, I would go to Sunbart to Globetrotter camps. Well, not too long ago, you were up here visiting in Vancouver and I got to meet you for the first time. And something that you mentioned during your conversations with me was how you teach your new white belt students. And you and I were talking about this and I thought, you know what? This would make an amazing topic of conversation. It's going to blow some people's minds on Reddit. So let's get into it. You know, you've been on both this and our premium podcasts probably about a dozen times now, Preet. And every time you come on, we talk about defensive jujitsu. But today we're going to talk about offense. We're going to talk about beating up white belts. <laughs> and I'm very excited about this. So the backstory for the listeners out there is, Preet, when we got together, you mentioned something interesting. You talked about how you've started teaching your white belts submissions first. And I love that idea. To me, in my mind, it you know <laughs> it makes me think of all of these people who come in and they saw jujitsu in the UFC and they want to learn to fight. So you're throwing them in there and letting them beat each other up. But I know there's actually a lot more to it than that. So... Tell me about this. Tell me about your new submissions first theory and why you're teaching this stuff to white belts before anything else now. Yeah, so to be honest, I'm I'm not doing the teaching. My um, buddy that I do, I run Estum Jiu-Jitsu with, Ronald Stimmer, he's doing the teaching. But uh, yeah, so we've been doing this for two years. We changed actually a little bit because we mm, our club turned towards the... Um, you know, let's say constraint-led method, I feel mm, kind of safe to say towards that ecological approach framework because we trained, like I've done a lot of, lot of different beginners courses during my years. So, you know, we had like a twice a year starting courses. We take people in September and then people in January and we have a three months course, we build them up. But now we're doing like a cycle like people jump in whenever they want, they do the 20 classes and then they jump out and they can start whenever they want. So that has been a big change what we do. It kind of makes it easier and we don't stress about it so much about the beginners. But because we tried a lot of, you know, beginners courses, you know, you always try to combine, okay, you have 20 classes. That means, you know, it's two and a half, I guess, two and a half months. So... Yeah, 10 weeks. So yeah, so 10 weeks, 20 classes. That's that's about two and a half months. We have done also beginners courses that has been like uh, three months. But uh, at the moment, we're doing two, sorry, 20 classes. And what's been happening is, you know, during the 20 classes or, you know, even a little bit longer, you usually do a combination of what you want them to know. Okay, the little bit guard, a little bit passing, a little bit side control, a little bit, you know, escapes. But it's never perfect, and you always kind of tweak it. You want to find the perfect balance, how much something you want to teach. 
but to, for everything there's little bit like too little time and what kind of submissions do you pick to show them you know and what kind of passes do you show and only one of them like submissions they work independently it doesn't make sense to teach you know 20 classes of guard passing or 20 classes of side control escapes or 20 classes of top submissions are the only one that kind of work individually that you can just teach them and so that was one idea and also we had like we have had problems with people like finishing beginners courses and they come to you know main group whatever we had back then and let's say they don't know sometimes submissions so much and they don't know what to tap to so you know somebody puts on a dars or something like sometimes it's not like a choke it's a crank you know and uh, people don't know it or they don't recognize the threat and they maybe they suffer too long in it and you know their neck a little bit hurts and and it's not as pleasant experience and we notice them you know like with leg locks also because maybe you teach you know achilles in a beginner's course maybe you have time for that but then there's other stuff and the they don't know the threats. They don't know what to tap to. So they're danger to others and to themselves. Because if they don't know other submissions, they become maybe creative, you know, and they do other stuff. Everything is like, a, you know, let's say, I'm not saying explosive or they're, they're not trained for the threats. So that was like a main thing. And I don't remember... I actually, I don't think it's my idea, but I don't know where, where I got the idea at the moment, if I'm thinking of it right now. I'm a little bit jet-lagged, so maybe it's because of that. So first, I told this to Ronald, let's do it, and he he's kind of like a, oh, I don't know, it's interesting. But then he came around, and so we've been doing this. We changed a little bit in August, but uh, I think we're doing Estum Jiu-Jitsu now. It's kind of like, I think, two years old already, a little bit older than two years. So we started with this and we liked it because people, first of all, people understand the context of submission. Like you said, they, they seen it, you know, UFC or whatever, and they understand that it's very final, you know, like it's uh, submission and the, the context they understand. They don't understand why the half card is needed or it's one of the awkwardest moments to put two beginners to the half card and explain what it, why it happens. So this makes sense. And also, I wanted them to be safe, so they know exactly what to tap to. And in 20 classes, actually, we we can teach a lot. So I'm naming submissions. Maybe I don't name now the 20 of them from the top of my head, but I guess I, I name some. So we do we teach them inside heel hook, outside heel hook, toe hold, knee bar, Achilles, calf slice, banana split. Then let's go upper body a little bit. Uh, we go, obviously, armbar, you know, triangle, Americana, Kimura, Tariko Plata, Dars, Anaconda, North-South choke, guillotine, re -neck choke, whatever is left after that, you know? And so we teach them main threats. And obviously, we have a small test in the end, actually, like uh, that seems to be working interestingly well, that we ask them five submissions. And uh, actually, they're studying, you know, because obviously there's a... It's a single independent classes. Um, so they don't, they didn't spar at first. So we changed a bit. I will talk about it later. And obviously they have a hard time sometimes remembering things. So adding that small test that, that we will show you, we will ask you like five submissions, made people actually stay after class, repeat uh, sort of things, remember, you know. So that was kind of fun side effect. And um, I think our like, I would say our rate of submission injuries went low. People didn't turn like roll out of leg locks anymore and everything. So because we do heel hooks in a gi also, so I don't really care about IBJF rules and stuff. I do jujitsu, and then we compete under different rules. So you know, even in Achilles, you know, if you have a good lock, people can roll out and hurt their knees. So now those things were out of the window basically. So it's still, you know, still, let's say things happen. Yeah. But the, it was, I, I would say it was way lower and uh, people, as much as the feedback was, people liked it because it was cool, you know, submission and, uh, you know, somebody wins, somebody lose. And then we, then we did it with the progressive resistance. And so they could drill a little bit and try and stuff. So that was fun. 
And now with ecological approach, you know, I will, like I said, I am more comfortable like saying constraint-led approach. Now we actually have more time because uh, Ronald felt that with uh, with that approach, he doesn't need that much time because there's less details and stuff. So actually, we we only do half an hour submission and half an hour we do games, like sparring like games to prepare them for live sparring. So, you know, obvious ones, guard passing ones, point the legs away, get to the knee line and, you know, some things like that or to talking about side control top, block the guard, you know, stop them going to the knees. So we do like a drills with them and we have 20 classes. So I, I believe that half of them are games like this that prepare them better for sparring and half of them we also try to introduce defensive structures because you still see values in them that actually people are using them right away and even if they're we can train them you know with resistance again with constraint led and task focused drills so defensively we teach them to keep the elbows close and everything else and obviously they you know they could spend way more time there but it's enough you know, for them. So right now it seems to be a nice combination of half an hour do submissions. And with really it's interesting with task focus stuff. It's kind of fun to teach it this way. And we need way less time. And then then it's like 10 classes of, you know, defensive stuff probably and 10 classes of games. I think that that's the one we do right now at the moment. So it's been fun. We're actually trying to like the th- First beginners probably will finish the new cycle when we teach it with constraints, the, all the submissions and games. I think they're finishing now, like December, end of December or something. So we're starting to have new people coming in and then we'll, we'll see again what happens. We hope that they're more ready to spar because that was usually the thing that they're sparred less and we can't introduce them sparring when they've done the course like two and a half like two thirds of course is done then we introduce them to rolling and stuff but now we hope that they know what the task is you know what the guard is what their objective is in a guard you know the past the knee line or whatever so we'll see how it works and what tweaks we have to do but submissions yeah we like the concept because yeah so they have defensively you know they can shut down or they know what to hunt and then you know I guess they they end up having problems passing and then maybe half guard makes sense and because they won't get to that because somebody has a good guard. So then it makes sense to introduce that or talk about it or, you know, whatever the main group is actually doing. And it's been it's been fun. It's it's really controversial in that sense. Whenever I mention that in your place or also in Finland and stuff, people are always like double checking. You do what? You teach beginners he looks? I was like, yeah. I know people that somebody's first day is an inside he look class and it's hilarious to me because always this been this been taught to us that it's dangerous and you shouldn't teach people you know beginners definitely he looks and they will kill each other and everything else but I think opposite seems to be true that they're aware of the threats we teach them that why it's dangerous to roll out and why it's you know why it's dangerous to be stupid and actually, people are more aware of threats. They they develop some control and everything else. And it's actually, it's, you know, you teach them the threats and you make them aware of that. You don't hide it, you know. So because not talking about it actually is more dangerous. So, so far, it's been, it's been fun. It's been definitely the submission part has been uh, really good. And that because of the method change, we have actually time to add all sorts of stuff because before the um, constraint that approach, we did, I don't know, like uh, 15 minutes maybe. We did some defensive structures because we still see, like I said, use for them because people are actually doing them, even if they do it like 15 minutes every class. And then we did some missions, but now we have more time actually in our hands. So, and it's been working great. That, and obviously, this, I'm still waiting to, you know, how they look and, how they kind of blend in to the main group and is it more smoother, so to speak? And I guess we ask them and stuff and how they feel and are they more ready for that? Because some of them have comparison methods, some of them don't, So, but we will monitor them. Yeah, so that's the long story short.
you know, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying, but it's just funny because you're Preet Mikkelsen, right? I mean, if anyone else said that, you just kind of nod your head and say, oh, that's interesting. But when it's the defensive BJJ guy, just the idea of people showing up to your class on day one and learning inside heel hooks is just kind of hilarious, but it does make sense, right? Everything you're saying, I, I see where you're coming from here. From an ecological approach, yeah, you can carve off some good games that will help people learn to feel the submission so they know what the danger zone is. And from my perspective, one thing that is good about your approach here is the focus is on making your students safe, making sure that they know when they're in trouble and how to stay out of trouble and how to avoid doing something dumb. Whereas at most gyms, often that first three to six month period, it's about trying to make them familiar with all of the positions and submissions and trying to get them reasonably effective in that first period. But the problem is you're not leading off from a place of safety. And as a result, you go to a lot of gyms and despite the instructor's best intent, you usually see a ton of injuries, especially at the junior level. And that's unfortunate because consistency is really the best way to get better. And if your people are getting injured all the time, you're preventing that from happening. And moreover, too, if someone has just tried jujitsu and at your gym they suffer an injury in the first two weeks, well, you haven't really done a good job teaching them, right? They came in here to get better, to learn how to defend themselves. They got hurt right away. And if they're new to jujitsu, there's a good chance they just won't come back. This isn't good for your business. It's not good for the person impacted. So your approach makes a lot of sense, actually. Just this idea that you start from within submissions And you let people play within there so that the recipient learns where the danger zone is and how to survive. And the attacker learns how to do it from a controlled standpoint and not just hurt someone without thinking. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I think I I understand that people are confused. That's why I'm not the only one that runs a club. So it's me, Ronald, and we have the young black belt Tom Manorm with us, you know, as a coach. So we're running a club as a whole, so it's not only my ideas, it's it's a lot of that just what we think. Yeah, so it took us a while. I started to talk to Greg Sauders like last year, October, I think, a little bit. And we had some private chit chats. And then uh, in August, I was ready to start teaching this way. And I think about the time then also we added to beginner's course some, uh, you know, constraint led. And now we're doing it more because we're more used to it you know we're trying to figure it out because it was like a bumpy road because of the the way the constraint led and ecological approach was presented a little bit or i don't know why they did that even like uh, you know it was i would just call it first mysticism a little bit but now we the more the podcasts are out and stuff the more it looks like uh, more reasonable things you know that it's yeah yeah now we understand this that and looks but the, it was presented a little bit uh, like more harder than it was and we're slowly getting into that and trying to you know tweak it and try to learn and try to do the games better and see like we have to teach one round you know like uh, the beginners course three months or two you know two and a half months to see that all the games we've done and okay now this game didn't work you know this the results we didn't like we will change it so we still have to teach it multiple times the section and the same comes to with the same goes to with, with submission because we have done it two years with, you know, with the old method. It was, you know, we did still some progressive resistance and everything based on what, how we learned before. But yeah, what's really changed is like the the constraint led added that both have tasks and now beginners having fun. They don't train each other. They train themselves, so to speak. One is inside the submission, trying to do the right things, you know, their task and one is finishing. So before it was, you know, one was playing a fool and one, you know, training other. So the very big thing was changed for us was that both have tasks. And um, yeah, so far, I really think that that's, that's, the submissions are the very interesting, fun context that people understand right away because, you know, they come to the class, what they want to do, they, you know, they don't know why the guard passing is important. And I think with games also what we do, it can be more fun and less low, so to speak, technical. If you start to teach beginners like a you know knee slide with 10 minutes of details, their head explodes and they don't understand actually why they need half of the shit. So, but submissions, yeah, it's kind of a fun part. It's, I don't know, for them, it's something real. You know, I win, I lose. 
and uh, we can teach them yeah like 20 every class is 20 uh, different submissions so like i said like teaching some beginners he look as a first class someone's that's hilarious but because you know like i said it's always considered it's dangerous and i know still people think you should teach them later and uh, people get injured and stuff but our experience says different and it's actually you know a lot of fun so to speak and to introduce them with with danger and then you know in in a way i don't know it sounds weird that let them decide so to speak what is dangerous what is not so we kind of make the you know people make that choice for them oh we don't trust you with that threat you know but actually if you do it well people can handle it you know and it's better to always i think you know having i'm a you know a new father also so having uh, if something is dangerous it's it helps to talk about it introduce it instead of just avoid talking about it and hide it you know because the kids will find it you know and uh, i had an experience with mm, i was in in canada and i and i stayed with someone that had a, like a basement and there's stairs obviously and there was a two floor building also so there's more stairs and what do i did like i just walk stairs every goddamn morning you know because i can't let my kid loose there and i can't you know block everything so we just walk stairs and i introduced him to threats and stuff and and it was uh, you know jokingly a bit annoying but now he's walking stairs like experienced stair walker you know so it's better to introduce them the threat instead of just hiding it so to speak so so in jiu-jitsu with submissions it feels our experience is right now the same and yeah like you know our sport still happens and i wouldn't say it happens more to the beginner so i i'm not saying our there's no like you know injuries it's still physical sport and things happen but because of the teaching submissions to beginners we haven't seen like rise of just submission injuries or people going crazy and everything because of that so but just more even because now sometimes i'm actually it's fun to roll with beginners as much as i roll with them because what they know is to how to shut down totally like you know elbows close and doing some turtles and stuff or hunt you they know submission so if you see if they see you, you play guard in a way or maybe now because we now we're playing games and stuff for guard passing but but before that they just knew how to shut down and hunt you and it was very very like I just laughed when I roll with beginners because they go for submissions. And that's kind of the point of the grappling anyway. And if they see a guard, they jump on your leg. And, uh, you know, if you defend the legs and stuff, then they find reasons. Oh, that, now I need a guard passing maybe, you know. So they build the contents and context and why later. But it was very, very fun to roll with because they, they don't have control. They don't know why they need it yet because they have a submission. So if they don't get to the control... Now there is a context. Oh, now you understand you need a control before the submission. So there's always a trade-off, you know, obviously if we would have time, we would teach something else also. And now with uh, with some games about side control and passing and everything else, we tapped into that also a little bit. So we'll see what the outcome will be. But yeah, submissions are, are, are fun. And, you know, the test, like I said, also helps they seem to be remembering better certain things because they are, you know, jokingly afraid of the test. And it's kind of sometimes people are actually very nervous because it is like single classes and we don't roll. So certain like, like um, let's say, not recovery, but certain retention. So retention could be like, you know, information retention could be better because they don't roll so much. And I'm still for beginner scores being separate and then they join the main course. There's some problems also because, uh, you know, they, it's still a course and some people feel that you do a course and then it's done and maybe how to go from one course to another can be smoother and some people quit because, oh, I did the course and now it's done. And uh, so it's joining people to the main group right away, like they come to the just join. Some people do that, but I, I feel that beginner's course separately works better because otherwise the main group i don't think the beginners get their necessary you know foundation for what they need because main group has their own cycles and stuff so at the moment we're we're sticking to that also and yeah we're kind of very happy that we 
we were able to do the change because it it sounded crazy, but I'm trying to recall by, while talking, where did I got it, the idea? Because I'm not going to say it was, you know, my genius mind, uh, but I think I, I got inspired by something and then we talked with Ronald and so I'm kind of, I'm sad I'm, I, I'm not remembering who gave me the input because it's almost like two years and maybe two years even like maybe two years and two years and a half ago, so I'm I'm sad I can't remember who was who gave me the input. But so far we're happy and we're we're you know tweaking the results. So uh, kind of constraint led method through our wrench into system. So we're trying to adapt to it and do it. Let's say for us even better. Yeah, you know what it reminds me of is how Salo Hibero used to present his old system back in the old uh, Jiu Jitsu University book. He kind of broke down jiu-jitsu into these five stages, starting with survival and then building on top of that from there with the final stage, I believe, being actually finishing a submission. And I always liked that mindset of teaching survival first, even before we get into talking about quote unquote defense. It's one thing to learn how to defend from a position, but if you're a white belt, probably the most valuable thing we can teach you for your day to day training is how not to get submitted all the time. And you're right that this does kind of fly in the face of what people in jujitsu often expect. A lot of places they will have this notion of advanced techniques that for one reason or another, they don't teach the white belts. Usually that's things like leg locks, like you said, and this is even enshrined in the IBJJF rules. There's techniques that you unlock at blue belt, like wrist lock, and then at brown belt, that's when you can do things like toe holds and knee bars and slicers. And so we set this idea that, oh, these techniques are, they're too advanced, too dangerous. So let's push them off into the future. But I agree with you that all that does is it scares people about those techniques and it also defers their learning in a way that's not helpful. As a relatively new father myself, similar to you, I see this and I battle with this all the time as any parent does. As your kid starts to get bigger and starts going off on little adventures and exploring, you have to get used to the fact that they're going to fall on their face. They're going to fall down the stairs. They're going to get dirty. They're going to do things and hurt themselves sometimes because they're kids and that's part of learning. And if you try to create an environment for your kid where they never get challenged and they never get hurt and they never get scared, then you're really setting them up for developmental problems because you're not allowing them to hit that wall and learn how to grow. And that's one area where the ecological approach adds a lot to the way that people think about jujitsu. In jujitsu, the common way that people often teach is step by step. But Eco tells us that we create a little arena and little games that people can play in so they can get comfortable and they can explore and try new things. And in your case, that arena is basically inside a submission. And I think that's an interesting way to teach things because, look, if you go to most white belt gyms, I mean, relatively early on, people are going to start practicing submissions. Some gyms defer them, but usually most people by white belt, they're doing submissions. So they're going to learn it soon anyway. The idea of starting them there, I don't think it's actually that much crazier than what a lot of gyms do, where maybe you start off by teaching them close guard. Because if you start from there, then within a few weeks, they're going to be doing arm bars and triangles anyway, right? So you might as well focus on the danger so that people learn how to stay safe. Yeah. And like I said, I, I like jiu-jitsu. I, I don't especially like IBJF jiu-jitsu. We compete under different rules. And uh, that wrist lock thing from blue belt and that leg locks from brown belt doesn't make any sense. And I think, you know, if you start to learn leg locks from brown belt, you're missing out. And uh, it's like already people have been doing leg locks since white belt, and then maybe they unlock the ability to do them in competition in brown belt, but they're already like efficient leg lockers, and then they compete. It doesn't make any sense to start learning leg locks in brown belt, and then you compete in brown belt. So just you're going to be so much behind. And I think I, if I remember correctly, you can correct me also, because wrist locks from maybe, let's say, blue belt, but... Banana split is uh, also allowed in white belt, I think. I don't recall specifically, but I, I don't recall it being banned in the adult divisions at any level. Again, I, yeah. I, I will fact check myself. If this turns out to be wrong, I will remove it. But I believe that adult white belts can do banana splits. Yeah, so that's that's kind of crazy because that is very dangerous submission. 
and uh, you know compared to what is more dangerous split or a wrist lock or uh, some leg lock and i don't know it's uh, for me it's weird that like no jitsu has now he looks you know and then i guess purple belt can do like knee bar and that kind of categorization uh, somebody has played god and decided that it's dangerous for white belts to do a knee bar or blue belts to do a knee bar and that that is really doesn't make any sense and it's sad that those things happen and there's no like a, i don't know debate about it and somebody just decides that this is the way they want it to be and uh, it is what it is and uh, that's why i guess in competition wise ib jeff is losing a little bit ground also and uh, nogi competitions are taking over and that's why they made a change in brown belt let's do league like you know he looks in nogi and then reaping is allowed and you know because the the point against he looks was reaping and everything else so like oh my knees and stuff but now they gave in so that's like weird politics and it is what it is you know so but yeah we we do this and uh, it seems to be totally fine reaps are normal so to speak and it's more than if you don't know what the reap is and how it manipulates your hip maybe that's dangerous but if you know what it is and how it manipulates again then if you're aware of that it's nothing extra dangerous so to speak so so yeah i feel really like teaching them the threats actually is helping them more than just you know not showing them things and then somebody does something to them in a gym and they're not super aware and i think that's way more dangerous actually and yes it's always like people trying to protect white belt and and uh, also like you know teaching them submission i guess is like only submissions is a little bit controversial and uh, obviously you want to teach beginners like right jujitsu whatever that is but i guess the way we do it right now it's a good compromise of what we think they should have you know having them like doing some games from guard passing and stuff and also what triggers them and like submissions and stuff what they understand what fascinates them what context they get and then if if we lure them in so to speak then it's time that to unlock and they maybe they they realize themselves later that what they need and then it's time to introduce them stuff so so we kind of have to consider also a little bit what they want or what they're meant to get and then there's like a middle way with that what we think they need and what they actually understand and want to do because uh, you know it shouldn't be boring it should be interesting and sometimes you just it's uh, too much like dry shujitsu so to speak and it can be actually quite fun and uh, submission and games for different parts of jujitsu i think the beginning can be more sport than we have you know people sweating since first day doing stuff with resisting opponents we don't ever talk about resistance at the moment because it's kind of like uh, we just add more constraints if you want to you know we don't want people to go crazy so certain things are just fixed right away so well you know we've always been tweaking so at the moment i'm not seeing anything like uh, oh let's tweak this let's tweak that but i was interested in yeah, to see that we actually have more time so we added some games but we haven't talked with ronald anything else about like oh let's do this or let's go back to doing something else so it seems to be working and and the feedback also i think has been positive so to speak so we'll see what happens yeah yeah you know <laughs> With what you're saying here, it kind of is jogging some old white belt memories from myself. And I, you know, I roll with a lot of white belts. I roll at a kind of a family casual gym. And so I, I tend to be one of the more experienced people on the mats. And there's some things I observe about white belts. And I've been there myself. I mean, I think we all have. When you're new, the main thing that you battle with is you're you're scared. Everything feels dangerous and exciting. And you're in this heightened sense of arousal doing jujitsu and you don't know how to control your body properly. And even if you did know how to control your body, you're not in a mindset to do it because you're in that heightened state of arousal. And I've said on the podcast before, I've changed my thinking about how you should teach beginners. I used to, in my mind, think about, well, what position would I start people from if I'm teaching them from day one? But now I don't think of it that way. Now, my thought is if I'm teaching someone from day one, the first things I want to teach them are how to regulate yourself, how to control your breathing and stay loose and 
just prevent yourself from doing anything stupid. Jiu-jitsu safety is all about control. And that's kind of one of the beautiful things about jiu-jitsu is when you get good at it, you can roll with control. But new white belts, they don't know how to do that. And they're definitely in no mindset to do that. Whereas the way that you're approaching this, where you kind of give them the dangerous parts first and let them get comfortable with that, I can see how that could work. Because if you show people all of the knives in the drawer, all of the scary things, and you teach them how to do them safely, then they're less likely to be scared in those situations. They have more knowledge about what to do. And hopefully they're going to be smarter then so that if they do get caught in that inside heel hook, they know how to escape safely. And they also know when they can't escape. And similarly, the person doing it because they went through the same program, they know what the danger zone is and they know how to take care of their training partner. Because the issue with so many white belts is because they're inexperienced in submissions, they have a tendency to try to hold on way longer than they should. They try to fight their way out of them, even when they're doing so without any technique at all. And a lot of the time, the person doing the submission is so excited that they go way too hard and they're getting submissions not through control, but through force and damage. Thinking back into my game, this is a big part of how my jujitsu changed as I got more experienced. I used to get most of my submissions just by, you know, going hard with them, being forceful, whereas now I'm much more slow and controlled and deliberate. And so I, I think that there's wisdom in what you're saying here about giving your white belts a toolkit from day one so that they take care of themselves and so that they also know how to take care of their training partners too. Yeah, so the idea that I like what Greg Souter said, uh, we have to prepare them for messiness. And if you teach them pure technique and stuff, and, you know, so the messiness is what drives them nuts, so to speak. And uh, they're not used to it, you know, things changing fast. And so I, I, I really think with those drills and stuff, with, you know, guard passing drills or the way we teach submissions, let's say we there's a Dars hold and we put them there, we, we cannot finish. Or let's say triangle, yeah? You put the triangle on, you can't finish. You just have to hold them there. Another person tries to unlock your legs. And they can, you know, roll around or whatever. Your job is to just keep the legs and don't squeeze. And we teach them control. And also, obviously, we teach the beginner. It's inside a triangle. Okay, push your shoulder in because that's the right thing. You can stack and, you know, sort of things. We, we know that's already a right behavior in that late stage anyway. So we're not letting them, you know, figure it out. We can tell them a little bit like what your aim is. Your task is to push the shoulder in. And the beginners, if you're finishing, your task is to like cover the shoulder. So shoulder is not seen and you only have like a head and arm and, you know, like a good things. So you can give them special special tasks and they're fighting about the right things, so to speak. And obviously they can, maybe you can open up the triangle a bit and then step by step, you know, make it harder for yourself. But I think that messiness, that is what makes them calm because if they now spar, they have met that before. They have experienced that before. And it doesn't throw them off. But if you don't add the messiness and kind of that thing to the to the equation, then sparring happens that they freak out because they never experienced that as a whole. And that is what what I think that's was missing when we taught things or, you know, in even earlier years. How to get used to the messiness and how to introduce the sparring and and also you mentioned something just uh, if I come back like you know they don't maybe teach submissions to beginners and I think a lot of the times uh, I think beginners are taught too much close guard anyway so close guard seems to be the one that dominates like beginner knowledge but I I don't think it's very fu- actually fundamental because I always have a question that. I ask people that right, which one you think is more fundamental is it open guard or closed guard and people have been taught mostly to say closed guard because that's what we see also in YouTube and and the beginners you know whatever the DVDs about beginners for beginners but if you ask like differently not, not like well, what is more fundamental but if you ask what kind of guard you can't play without you know, then it becomes, oh, without open guard, I can't play. I, without close guard, I can easily play. So I think also just teaching people like, you know, I, I, I'm not saying wrong things, but if you concentrate teaching people like close guard, I think you can hinder them other ways. So it's really have to be careful, like the skills, what they need. They need open guards, you know, and they, they, need, they need to develop the hip movements and they need to like some control from side control, block the hips, stop them going to the knees and then stay there forever. 
And the close guard is kind of like exception a little bit of some open guard version. I like to actually call it close guard, not closed, because closeness is what defines it a little bit. So in Estonian language, I can't play with that so much with the words. So in that sense, I think people need to consider also that if you watch what actually happens in matches, you see very rarely close guard. There's still some matches with close guard and always some people have made a career out of that. But overall, I think they need better open guard, you know? So that's why I think we also concentrate more on open guard when it comes to beginners. And uh, obviously you need to know what to do in close guard and how to get stuck because if somebody has it, you shouldn't panic. But it should be like, you really have to call, like see what, what is actually happening, you know, and uh, what's the ratio of things and what what they need to know. So I think that's what also happening in, in with our, you know, beginner's course. And also I think the beginner's course is the danger is to, to fill them up with everything, you know? So let's say I feel it right now, it's a good balance, like half an hour submissions and half an hour, let's say we have something else. So 20 classes is like uh, all together. So 10 classes, we do half an hour, like I said, structures and half an hour, we do those games. So I think it's it's not too chaotic. I know with ecological approach, the classes are sometimes, I don't think it's a bad thing, it's just more chaotic. Uh, like people do, like Craig likes to say, like they play full game every class. And uh, in a way we can also this way, because you know changing things up, doing this drill, doing that drill, keeping them different also makes sense. So as much as we start to understand the ecological approach, uh, you know, and the constraint-led stuff, then maybe we tweak here and there something because uh, we have time and we'll, we'll see. We have to just see what kind of people come out and then we know what they're missing on what we want to add and, you know, what's the average outcome. So that's, uh, we're kind of excited also about it. That What are the people that are coming out of that beginner's course if they really attend all the classes? And so, yeah, so kind of December is that month and maybe we start to see more of those people. So we have more information. You bring up some interesting concepts here. And one is you've questioned a lot of the things that many people would consider the quote unquote fundamentals in jujitsu. And closed guard is a perfect example of that. At least when I was coming up, closed guard was kind of the number one thing that you're going to learn if you're a new white belt. And I think a lot of gyms still do that. But I agree with your assessment entirely that it's not really the most useful thing that you need to learn from an on the ground defense standpoint. And I know that you're not the only one who thinks this. Rob Bernacki has said many times he teaches open guard first. In fact, he bans his students from doing close guard until they've got some competence with open guard. And the reason why is because I may be misquoting him here, but what he had told me was that when you're a white belt, if you don't have any tools and all you have in your arsenal is closed guard, you basically learn to just hold the person there and not do jujitsu. So neither you nor the other person are learning anything because by the fact that you've got two unexperienced people doing closed guard, they're basically just not moving. They're not really learning. Whereas open guard, because it's fluid and dynamic and there's a lot more happening, it gives you more practice. And you've talked about this a few times about how Greg Sauders talks about the importance of the messiness in sport. And that's so true. I think that when people think of martial arts like jujitsu, they think about these perfect techniques. And if you do it right, no one can stop you and you can just slice through their defenses. But that's not how it works. The way that you get taught things by your instructor, if they're using the old model and they're showing you step by step instruction that never works, right? I mean, your instructor will show you all of the steps and you try to do it on a person and those steps just fall apart because your opponent did something you didn't expect. So the real learning happens when you get messy and things are ugly and your training partner is doing things you don't expect and you have to adapt on the fly. And that's what eco is ultimately all about. And I think that this is also why a lot of people in more traditional gyms get so frustrated because they're they're learning these steps and they can follow the steps just fine against a non-resisting opponent. But as soon as things get messy, nothing works anymore. I mean, this is I'm sure you've heard this. This is one of the most common beginner complaints I have heard. People tell me all the time I've been training for six to eight months and I feel like I'm terrible at this. I don't know how to do anything. Every time I try to do one of these techniques against a resisting person, it never works. I feel like I'm the worst grappler ever. <laughs> and my response is usually 
that's normal. We all went through that. And that's just a side effect of the way that a lot of gyms teach, because the way they're teaching you techniques is not reflective of the way that you're actually going to do these things in a live environment. That's the perception action coupling part of ecological dynamics is you want your training environment to be as close to to real life as possible. If you're doing this against an unresisting opponent and you're breaking it down into these perfect steps, that just doesn't reflect the messiness that happens when you're actually sparring with someone. Uh, true. Yeah. So that's why, you know, the, the close guard, I think it comes from the like old jiu-jitsu line, something like, because open guard wasn't a thing anyway, you know, then close guard was a thing. And maybe it's just carried to this day. But uh, teaching beginners close guards just like dominantly, uh, pr like what's the what's to call it, mainly, and it doesn't make any sense because you don't develop hip movement or just let's say close guard hip movement is very difficult. And I know why people like it, you know, because it's you feel safe, you know, that people, somebody is be between your legs and you have time to work on. But yeah, so for overall, because you would need very good open guards that people can't pass and then you're a black belt, you know? And then you can figure out whatever the guard you like. Is it close guard, De La Riva? Is it Spawn Spider? So you need a good open guard that people have a hard time passing and then you specialize to some attacking system that tends to happen to you most likely. And, you know, is it under guard, like X or slash guard? Is it like front you stay or something? So you figure it out. But close guard, I, I really think that close guard is a, like for me, it's like, like De La Riva or, you know, spider. You just get there. And if you're long-legged, you're meant to play it more, you know, you can body triangle people from close guard and you specialize in that. And, uh, but if some people just can't play it at all, maybe, you know, and, and, and yeah, so we really have to, certain old mindsets obviously are, are still in jujitsu and certain even old mindsets are dominating, you know, like even... Even in, let's say, recently I've been, if you're doing seminars, I've been saying like, you know, people know this all the time. Don't put your arms on a mat in close guard, you know? You actually can do it fine and nothing happens. And uh, most white belts are taught, you know, like, or videos in YouTube always show it. If arms on a mat, oh, they do on, you know, they do a Kimura to me or or hip pump or, or something. But if you do it really like correctly, you know, a little bit elbows in and fingers pointed out and everything, those things are actually quite difficult. So... I feel also Jitsu is like, let's say, full of half sentences. Like the like right way would be say, like, don't don't put like arms on the mat if you don't know what to do, or or don't turn your back if you don't know what to do. Or just people are like, don't turn your back, you know, don't put your hands there. It's like you can do anything you want, basically. Just you have to be aware of the threats and always there's trade-offs. And I'm fighting those those half sentences a lot because they have hindered my, let's say, possibility to find out answers because certain answers I don't find because I'm programmed to not look there. So, but now I just do it. I stack inside a guard, you know, to actually to stand up, I stack first sometimes, you know. So a lot of, a lot of things that are, are like forbidden, so to speak. And some people do it. I'm not saying I'm the only one who stacks, but most likely they don't. So a lot of, I think we need more eyes on on how to actually teach beginners what actually they need what actually is jiu-jitsu what actually you know they get so to speak so it should be a balance about what i think they need and what they understand and what they consider fun and i totally agree with the feedback that it's very common that that people think it's their fault that they don't get jiu-jitsu and they think you know it's they're bad or they're not talented whatever but I really think it's like the way we do jiu-jitsu. So I, I would like to take like, you know, full responsibility. And I've seen crazy things happen to white belts. If I teach them with a constrained method, the, uh, if I give them exact good task and the game is right, like magic happens. They look so smart. They know exactly what to fight for. And uh, I don't think they look beginners. And I, I made people skip belts in four hours, you know? so to speak. I, I, I'm not giving them belts, but if somebody was a white belt after four hours of just, let's say, turtle, we do open turtle, like the straight arms we play, we don't do anymore. I don't emphasize anymore the head on a mat. It just happens if it happens, but we change the way we do turtles. And uh, I, I can make a white belt skip belts. So after four hours, they, they, they look like a purple belt, you know, in that specific area. So these days, I don't know anymore what, what is a belt anymore, because 
it's not about technique accumulation. It's just knowing the like we call them background drills, knowing what you have to do, and then you know either you escape from there, you stand up, you pull guard, whatever. But it, it's not about anymore like oh you need ten techniques and that's why it, it takes a while to to learn it. And uh, yeah, so I've been I've been doing a lot of open turtles. Like we call it at the moment, open turtles. So it's straight arm, kind of similar to referee position in in NCAA. So and the stuff I've been able to do, and definitely with beginners, is like it's amazing. It's like uh, it's totally night and day. So you know, we'll we'll see how it all trickles down to our beginners courses and all to my teaching. So right now, I'm happy that I I leaped, so to speak, and slowly getting into eco because there's. I would say there's a lot going on and there's some, I would say, I don't know, some is even misleading information by by people. So I don't know why they do it. But I think when you go slowly in, I think the magic disappears and it, it will be the logical outcome. And then I like it so far. Certain, you know, certain science, deep science, I still don't understand. And I don't see it affects my teaching that much, but I still slowly getting in and you know trying to absorb more and you know new terminology and stuff and so it's a at the moment with all the beginners courses and all the you know constraint led stuff it's really interesting interesting period of of my jiu-jitsu career because i've been doing this 23 years and to find something that i would say radically different compared to what i did before is very very fun and very very refreshing and 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 to add this to beginners and stuff, it's it's very, very fun, and you know, kind of kind of sparks the jitsu life and makes everything like nice again and very like uh, challenging. And I'm looking forward to you know playing with it and tweaking it. And, you know, otherwise sometimes it gets boring. It's same thing, same thing, and but now it's very very fun again. So I'm kind of happy about that also. Yeah, the idea of playing turtle open where you're not putting your head on the mat. I actually, at some point, I would love to have a, just a completely separate chat with you about that because you know, I'm a turtle player and I've started doing the same thing too. Well, actually, maybe I never was putting my head on the mat. I always thought I was, but then I realized at some point I'm actually not doing it as consistently as I I think I am. I do it sometimes if it's just the right thing to do, but I generally tend to kind of play with my head up off the mat. And this kind of, you know, makes me think of something that you've been mentioning here as well. A lot of the the things about jiu-jitsu that we think are fundamental, I think maybe are not really that fundamental. I think jiu-jitsu people sometimes use the word fundamental when what they really mean is traditional. And those are two very different things. I would say that back on the topic of closed guard, closed guard is a traditional jiu-jitsu move. But I would not say it's a fundamental. Like you said, you can get pretty good at jujitsu without ever playing closed guard. I rarely play closed guard anymore these days. I almost always go open, play turtle. And, you know, if I were teaching someone from day one, I wouldn't teach them closed guard. I would start with, here's some tips for controlling your breathing, for staying loose. And if you wind up on the bottom and you want to learn technical stuff, I mean, the, probably the first thing I teach most people these days is just stand up, <laughs> right? And, and how to do that yeah. safely. And that that flies in the face of what a lot of people would call fundamentals in jiu-jitsu. But I think we have to remember that a lot of these decisions that were made about what's fundamental or not, they're arbitrary decisions that were made decades ago based on what people thought at the time effective fighting looked like, and also based on their agendas, too. We have to remember a big part of why the rules are the way they are is probably because it sells Brazilian jiu-jitsu. We're encouraging people to go to the guard because that's what is unique about classic Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And so for a long time, people disparaged Turtle greatly about what just a useless, terrible position it is. And I think a big part of that is because People were avoiding that position because it was not point scoring. But I mean, it's so funny how much that conversation has changed with the rise of the ADCC. I'm sure you've noticed this too, where suddenly in the last few years, everyone has gone from turtle is this dumb, awful position to all of a sudden, I have to learn to get good at turtle. If you want to succeed at the highest levels, you have to have a good turtle. And it's just, it's been a very, very big culture shift. And a big part of that is just because of the rule set. It's a silent guide that alters how we learn. The rules change the outcome. And so it's important to understand sometimes and to question these things that the things we think are the right way to do things, 
just because they're they're traditional, that doesn't actually mean they're fundamental. And again, you also bring up some good points about people just speaking in half sentences. And I think that's true as well. People in jujitsu tend to speak in a lot of just absolute statements. I remember going through this when I was a white belt. I remember coaches telling me, never do this. You brought up a great example about putting your hands on the mat. I was told, don't ever put your hands on the mat. You're going to get kimura or oma plotted. I've been training like 15 years. I don't think that's ever happened to me once where I put my hand on the mat and someone kimura me or, or oma plotted me. So where does that really come from, right? Where does that knowledge come from if it's not actually something that that happens as much as we would think? And the problem is we as human beings, we're kind of biased towards these absolute statements because they sound so confident. But something that I've learned is there's this thing called a certainty heuristic, right? We we have this bias in our heads towards these absolute statements. And so now whenever I hear an absolute about jujitsu, I question it. Because I know it's probably not actually an absolute. There's probably some missing knowledge there. Yeah, I agree. And also, I would say, turtle has been, you know, it's always, I would say, like, ah, I told you before, I, I talked about this five years ago. But now, even MMA, it's, you said the uh, ADCC, yes. Even the ADCC, like, you know, owners and stuff have said publicly, I think, if you don't want you to be scored against, then learn turtle, you know. And also recently, I think if you saw the fight with Usman and uh, Chumayev, and Usman used straight arm turtle to avoid getting knocked out and getting choked. Chumayev was in, you know, hooks in and stuff. And there are some cases that Usman was almost getting belly down, then you know, and then he went to straight arm turtles and he hid his head, and he stayed there, you know. And then you know, I'm not gonna, oh, this is the greatest evidence ever, but this is, you know, this is something, you know. I'm always not going to willing to test it, but this is something that he, he survived. And, you know, Greg Jones and Volkanovski trained turtles for Makashev fight, I think, because they were trying to stand up and not end up in a bottom side control. And as soon as the Makashev would punch from turtle, they would try to stand up. And so they have to open the grip to punch. So turtle has been interesting because, you know, if I mentioned it back in the day and then, you know, people were like, I would I would say it could work, you know, and that would make sense. And but people didn't have anything to, to believe, you know, from the point or something. I don't know how to say it. But now there's randomly more evidence during the years, and we see actually turtles also in in you know in MMA. It's not like like everything. It's not always gonna work, you know, something. But there's still enough evidence of it working also. So that's been also fun to watch. And even Craig Jones, like I said, has been doing himself also straight arm turtles and stuff. And he has a video series, I think, just stand up, you know, just ruin jiu-jitsu by standing up. And that's been different, you know, kind of adding fighting attitude to jiu-jitsu, just stand up from everywhere, you know. And it's a fun period, so to speak. And there's not much like instructionals, I think, about it, considering, you know, we've seen Usman and Volkanovski and... I think Greg Jones stuff is there, but it's still compared to, you know, like there's relatively few DVDs about it, you know, like what actually, like compared to how much we have like De La Rivas out there and all, all kinds of open guards. So defensively, I think we, we have more room for some minds working on things and having their perspective of the turtle. And then, you know, so, so I, th- I think still that's, that's happening or should happen. If it doesn't, you know, I have ideas to fulfill it also with more planning, like some new turtle DVDs and stuff. I don't know actually how to teach it because I can teach it only with eco at the, like you know constraint led method. I don't know what are techniques about it because it's more just we do games and we just add complexity and it's hard to show you actually put technique about the turtle if I do it. But yeah, that's a different story totally. But yeah, the jiu jitsu is full of those you know, things that just people keep repeating and never thinking about it, you know, don't put your arms on a mat. And and if I actually, if you actually, you know, ask them why, you know, oh, Kimura, but if I do this, he won't. And, but, you know, people maybe have their own excuses. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, overall, it's a good idea or something then. And they're defending also those old sentences instead of just like throwing them out and actually saying things differently. So it's it's easier to follow and it's harder to break out so to speak, and say things something differently, you know. It's easier to just get the previous information and you don't have to think about it. Somebody said something, it looks looks smart, sounds smart, let's take it. 
And uh, I think that has happened a lot during the years, you know, and always the sentence is keep your elbows close, let's say. But if you go like, if you ask actually people close where, you know, so then it's like, uh, you know, a lot of question marks actually in people's faces is like, close where? Like, what does it actually, that does it mean? Because I know that elbows don't have to be close. Uh, maybe one, yeah, not always both. And the open guard people know like, oh, keep your knees to the chest. Uh, I would say not always. You can actually have one knee on a chest and then other not. And so, you know, a lot of those half sentences and if you, or even just something like elbows close, like where, why, how, you know? And just it's like elbow, elbows close, oh, water is wet, yeah? And you don't question that anymore or what it actually means, you know? Where, why? So I think that's that's really important that we that we keep challenging those old like wisdoms. And maybe the, those wisdoms came with a package and that, that actually explained everything. But I think in some point it got passed down without explanations and it just became the thing. So, and then we really need to like start thinking about it. And also that's, that's what that teaching method, you know, that eco gets some resistance from people and it's interesting to follow that and how people react to it and how sometimes stubborn the eco guys are, you know, they're later like, a, like, this is it. And this is the best. And, and it's, it's a fun period. I, I, I think it settles in some point and, and we move on as, as a, as a stronger community and we have to just understand. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, overall for us in our club is interesting and overall what's happening in a world. It's, it's also interesting. It almost feels like a, like small change or a little bit bigger change is coming and we'll see i'm interested to see where it where it heads and how it how it so to speak settles and what's the final change gonna be you know is the jiu-jitsu clubs will change you know compared also what we talked about beginners courses is there some change or or are we still doing the close guard and you know stuff or is it changing also teaching you know how we how we approach stuff so i think it's interesting period to be alive and uh, see the jiu-jitsu development in the world Awesome. Well, hey, as someone who's just been through this process recently, Preet, if someone were listening to this and they thought, man, I want to try this, I want to start with a submissions first approach at my gym, and I want to build that up using eco games. Have you found any resources or best practices in your journey that helped you learn how to do this? If I were a coach and I wanted to do what you've done here, where would you send me to, to learn how to do this and get started? (laughs) Mm, good question. At the moment, I would just say contact me. And then I know I have to harass Ronald because he has all the materials about it and how he structures the class. So I have to harass him. But I think if somebody is interested, they can contact me through Messenger or Instagram, you know, Preet Michelson. I think Instagram is Michelson. So then we can talk about it. And because I don't think there's any material out there, you know, like, why would you do it? And just maybe one thing I would say, you know that I always forget his name, the art of learning. Josh Waitskin. Yeah, yeah, I always I forget the name. And he talked about, you know, starting from the end, you know, and submission is kind of the end. You know, you you play the game with the king and a pawn and a, and a, and a king, and you play that game first. And then you build up from there the complexity, switch on the pieces, add complexity, and do the middle game, and finally you, you end up in a, in a beginning. So... So mission is kind of starting from the end. What is the end goal of here? And then you build complexity, you know, and then you go further from submissions. And then basically like you, the furthest is you're an open guard and then you have to pass and get to submission. So this is also starting from the end. So if you read, for example, that book, or if you read like, you know, teaching the end in mind, I think you can Google there's some, some information. So that helps, I guess, understanding that why, why you even should teach from the end because chess is very complex and they use it. They don't teach you from the beginning. They teach you those mini games. And uh, yeah, I don't mind if you, people contact me and and then we'll see how much I have to uh, harass Ronald and what comes out of that. But if there are people that are interested, I'm willing to share what we know so far. And and if enough people do it, then I probably I make it like a, I don't know, like a document or something that we have to just harass around a bit and write everything down like you know 
like in simple terms and and then I, I don't mind sharing it so it's not a secret what we do and just people have to know we will change our minds when we have to and but that's what we do right now so we're happy to share Awesome. Well, as I always do, I will put those links to your messenger and your Instagram in the show notes just to make it easy for people to contact you quickly. But I would also ask, I mean, let's talk about your platform, right? Defensive BJJ. One of the things I've always loved about your platform is that it's two way. You've got a whole community in there where it's not just you sending content out to people, but you give them homework, you give them projects, you invest your own time in your customers, you treat them like remote students. I think you and I are the only people who really do that. Most online subscription sites are just one way. It's just a big library of content. Have you ever thought about doing defensive BJJ coaching? I mean, if someone were an instructor, and they wanted to learn how to do this in their gym, if they were a defensive BJJ subscriber, would they be able to send you questions there as well? Or do you just do rolling on defensivebjj.com? No, I think you mean like, uh, what kind of questions? What, what do you mean? Well, I'll give you an example. I mean, as you know, BJJ Mental Models Premium, we do rolling reviews. So if a grappler wants high level detailed feedback on their game, they can send in a video clip and we'll have a really elite black belt break it down and give them personal feedback. But something that came up a while ago was people started asking, well, I'm less interested in my technique and more in my coaching. You've got some really good coaches on the platform. Can I get them to teach me how to coach as opposed to just teaching me technique? So we started accepting submissions from people where they could send in videos of themselves coaching. And our coaches would instead give feedback on how to run a class better or how to be clearer in their communication instead of the normal feedback, which would be how to be a better grappler. And I'm just wondering if someone wanted to use you as a resource for coaching, is that something that you do through defensive BJJ as well? Like, would you be willing to take questions from people who are running a gym and they want to know, you know, maybe I'm not asking you how to escape from turtle, maybe I want to know how do I, as an instructor, teach my students better how to escape from turtle? Is that something that you would ever do? I would take it on. Yeah, if somebody is interested, I wouldn't mind, and we can do it the same through defensive BJ. Interesting. Yeah, you asked that because I think Christian Grauert he started it kind of shut down the project, but he started the teaching BJ kind of community, and there are a lot of coaches actually were involved but then it turned out that a lot of many people don't have time so it was about more about teaching and there was actually i think if people go to teaching bj i think there's some still there's some resources that are resources that are actually free so that was more about actually teaching so i was also made some videos for that but if somebody's interested yes i could tell them what i do now or how i do now because Again, like uh, this constraint led approach through like a wrench to the the way I've coached. And I started to coach this way, new way in like in my gym also in starting August. So I messed up enough classes and, you know, now I have more experience about it. And it's sometimes not easy to teach this way. And, uh, but I can guide people that maybe I tell them what I did wrong or what kind of mistakes I did if they want to, you know, use this constraint-led method, so what to look for, what to do, because I'm new in this, and um, I guess I can teach them, I can show them like how I do like uh, my seminars, and I can easily explain them how I, I teach, let's say, turtles with those games and what usually the side effects are, so I have enough experience of doing longer classes, like, you know, typical I do open turtle, it's two by two hours, so I, I don't mind explaining this to people. You know, so yeah, if somebody's interested and I can tell them, I can, you know, make them understand what I do right now and how it's all evolved and what they should expect and how they should mess up other things to, to learn and then they adapt and it's, it's, a, it's a journey. But uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind if somebody's contacting me about that also. So yeah, all good. Awesome. Well, I'll put a link to the show notes to your platform. That's defensivebjj.com for people who haven't checked it out. I always recommend Preet's platform. One of the things I love about it is it's such a common beginner problem to get stuck just feeling helpless and like you don't even know how to defend yourself. And so I've, I've always loved the idea of starting defense first, helping people build up their confidence in their ability to survive and then 
expanding from there. And additionally, I mean, it sounds like now if you're a coach and you want to learn how to deploy this stuff in your gym, that's an option as well. So I'll, again, I'll put a link in the show notes. DefensiveBJJ.com is where you go. I'll also put a link to all of our stuff. Everything we make lives at BJJMentalModels.com. The main thing that people know us for, of course, is this podcast. There's tons of content on there that's all free, so you can go there and keep yourself busy for quite some time. Additionally, that's also how you can sign up for our awesome free newsletter, and that's also where you can learn more about BJJ Mental Models Premium. So if you join Premium, the main thing that you're going to get is an entire library of audio content talking about jujitsu strategy concepts tactics philosophy mindset kind of more the big picture stuff and not really the nuts and bolts stuff that gets covered in a lot of instructionals like i mentioned earlier you also get direct rolling reviews from some amazing competitors josh mckinney recently joined our coaching team other people on our team include amanda bruce brianna st marie margo ciccarelli it's just a really stacked roster and it's an amazing opportunity to get very detailed feedback from some of the best grapplers in the world i really don't know any other way that you can do this other than on bjj mental models premium so definitely recommend checking it out if you haven't already all of that's at bjjmentalmodels.com and again i'll put a link to that and also create all of your stuff in the show notes as well but again man thanks so much for coming by you know i always love having these chats with you i just appreciate how you of all people are willing to question the norm and try new things that kind of go against some of the established truths <laughs> that people believe in jiu-jitsu, which I think we're increasingly discovering are maybe not as absolute as initially thought. So thanks again for coming by. Yeah, all good. Thank you for having me. And it's always, I enjoy our chats and yeah, and love coming back. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, thanks again. And thanks to the listeners too. We'll talk to you next week. Take care. Take care.